The definition of amoral, according to Merriam-Webster's, is having or showing no concern over whether an action is right. First of all, I got a lot of objections saying that atheism is amoral because it makes no moral claims. Duh! This is true, but this misses the point of the argument. My point is that an atheist, if he's to be consistent with his philosophy, must also be unconcerned with right and wrong for the reasons stated elsewhere. Second, let me rephrase the title of the video to avoid any confusion on what I'm arguing. I'm arguing that atheism implies moral relativism, and the problems that follow with moral relativism. Now to deal with the objections raised. First, people said that we know right and wrong because we needed to cooperate and thrive as a society. Thus, we learned right and wrong through evolutionary needs. I have no problem with this at all, but this misses the point of the argument entirely and was the point of me making the moral epistemology versus moral ontology video. The question of how we come to think of actions as right or wrong is irrelevant to the question of whether we should think of anything as right or wrong in the first place. They are two different questions, how versus why. Sure, we may come to think of certain things as wrong because of societal needs, but that's not the question. The question is, why should we even think of things as wrong or right in the first place? not how we've come to think of things as right or wrong. The second objection was a foundation that many tried to propose. People said, that which causes harm is evil. Thus, morality can be measured in terms of how much harm versus benefit it causes. But this naturally raises the question, why is the well-being of humans good? Why should we define it that way? Why should I care whether humans flourish or not? Such definitions and obligations are arbitrary without an objective standard. In the absence of any objectively existing standard, there is no reason to define it as such. We may come to feel that it is right, but just because our instincts tell us that the well-being of humans is good, why should we accept that? Suppose Bob comes along and defines that which is good as that which promotes the well-being of white people only. What makes your definition of goodness more valid than his? In the absence of an objective good, there is no reason to think that one definition of goodness is better than another. Why should I care about the flourishing of conscious creatures in the absence of any moral obligations imposed on me by an objective standard? In the absence of any sort of objective standard, and we don't even have to call it God at this point, why should you force me to care about the flourishing of people? Why should you care if I work to that end or if Bob works to promote white supremacy? Discrimination is wrong because it harms people, says the atheist. But of course, why is harming people wrong? Without an objective standard, nothing makes one definition of good more valid than another. All definitions of goodness become arbitrary. Just saying murder is wrong because it causes harm to people begs the question. Of course murder causes harm to people, but why is causing harm to people wrong? Suppose Bob likes causing harm to other people besides white people. Again, he defines the good as that which promotes white supremacy. On what basis do you condemn his definition of the good as wrong and uphold yours as right? As an atheist, you have no logical basis to do this. Or at least, you have just as much of a logical basis to do this as I do to condemn your preference of ice cream. Now, Dr. Harris says, but we can imagine creatures being in the worst possible misery, and it's obviously better for creatures to be Flourishing, the well-being of conscious creatures is good. Well, of course it is. That's not the question. We agree that all things being equal, flourishing of conscious creatures is good. The question is rather, if atheism were true, what would make the flourishing of conscious creatures objectively good? Conscious creatures might like to flourish, but there's no reason on atheism to think that it would really be objectively good. Now here Dr. Harris I think is guilty of misusing uh, terms like good and, and bad, right and wrong, in equivocal ways. He will often use them in non-moral senses. For example, he'll say there are objectively good and bad moves in chess. Now that's clearly not a moral use of the terms good and bad. You just mean they're not apt to win or produce a winning strategy. It's not evil what you've done. And similarly, in ordinary English, we use the words good and man, bad in a number of non-moral ways. For example, we say Notre Dame has a good team. 
Now, we can hope it's an ethical team, but that's not what's indicated by the win-loss record. That, that is a different meaning of good. Or we say, that's a good way to get yourself killed. Or that's a good game plan. Or the sunshine felt good. Or that's a good route to East Lansing. Uh, or there's no good reason to do that. Or she's in good health. All of these are non-moral uses of the word good. And Dr. Harris's contrast of the good life and the bad life is not an ethical contrast between a morally good life and an evil life. It's a contrast between a pleasurable life and a miserable life. And there's no reason to identify pleasure misery with good and evil, especially on atheism. There's also another problem with defining the good as that which promotes human flourishing. Without any sort of basis, this becomes a form of speciesism, an unjustified basis in favor of your own species. There's no reason to uphold human flourishing as better than other creaturely flourishing. Sure, we may come to think of this as wrong because of evolution, but why should I think of it as wrong? Again, note the distinction. Instead of asking, how have I come to think of this as wrong, I'm asking, why should I think of it as wrong in the first place? Now, let's take Sam Harris and just circularly assume that the good is identical to human flourishing. In other words, that which is good is that which is beneficial to human well-being, and that which is detrimental is evil. General human happiness is what we're aiming to promote on this view. To illustrate why this view is not only unjustified, but simply untenable, we need only examine it through the law of identity. Let's identify the good as the general well-being of humans, that which promotes more benefit for humanity than harm. As Sam Harris points out, his moral landscape would no longer be a moral landscape if murderers or wrongdoers could inhabit the peaks of well, hum, human well-being. However, we can easily conceive of a possible world in which wrongdoers inhabit the peaks of human well-being. As the infamous William Lane Craig says, But Dr. Harris has to defend an even more radical claim than that. Uh, he claims that the property of being good is identical with the property of creaturely flourishing. And he's not offered any defense of this radical identity claim. In fact, I think we have a knockdown argument against it. Now, bear with me here. This is a little technical. On the next to last page of his book, Dr. Harris makes the telling admission that if uh, people like rapists, liars, and thieves could be just as happy as good people, then his moral landscape would no longer be a moral landscape. Rather, it would just be a continuum of well-being whose peaks are occupied by good and bad people or evil people alike. Now, what's interesting about this is that earlier in the book, Dr. Harris explained that about three million Americans are psychopathic. That is to say, they don't care about the mental states of others. They enjoy inflicting uh, pain on other people. But that implies that there's a possible world which we can conceive in which the continuum of human well-being is not a moral landscape. The peaks of well-being could be occupied by evil people. But that entails that in the actual world, the continuum of well-being and the moral landscape are not identical either. For identity is a necessary relation. There is no possible world in which some entity A is not identical to A. So if there's any possible world in which A is not identical to B, then it follows that A is not in fact identical to B. Now since it's possible that human well-being and moral goodness are not identical, it follows necessarily that human well-being and goodness are not the same as Dr. Harris has asserted in his book. Now, it's not often in philosophy that you get a knockdown argument against a position, but I think we've got one here uh, by granting that it's possible that the continuum of well-being is not identical to the moral landscape, Dr. Harris's view becomes logically incoherent. And all of this goes to underline my fundamental point that on atheism, there's just no reason to identify the well-being of conscious creatures with moral goodness. Atheism cannot explain the reality, the objective reality, of moral values. 
Let me pose another scenario that may clarify. Suppose in 1,000 years the world is populated by a bunch of gang-raping males that share one female, a 6 to 1 ratio, and females are no longer needed to produce life because at this point artificial conception is really, really advanced. We know that when sex happens, or when pleasure occurs, endorphins are released which promote health. And suppose the other gang rapers get a kick out of seeing this. In this future society, where it can be demonstrated that these acts, while hurting one person, are actually causing a greater amount of benefit to the general human population than harm, would it be wrong to gang rape? I'd say it would still be wrong even though it's promoting general human well-being. But that means in this possible world, the good is not identical to general well-being of humans even though gang raping would still bring about more well-being than harm. If there are possible worlds in which the good is not identical to general human well-being, then actions that would promote human well-being in these possible worlds cannot be described as good. It follows through the law of identity that if there are possible worlds in which the good is not identical to human well-being, then the good cannot actually be identical to human well-being. Dark Antics has very eloquent expressed this view of right and wrong in the video linked below. He says that Hitler's actions are unjustified because there is no evidence to show what he did brought about a greater amount of benefit than harm. He rightly states that the burden of proof is on those who would claim that those actions did. However, we can easily conceive of a possible world, perhaps a thousand years in the future, where analysis concludes that in the long run the Holocaust actually brought about more benefit than harm, perhaps because of population issues. Perhaps in the long term, overpopulation was prevented. Maybe some other piece of evidence is found suggesting the long term benefit of the Holocaust. Would that then justify the Holocaust, just because it brought about a more benefit than harm? Would we have to reclassify the Holocaust from an act of evil to an act of good? If someone, claiming that the Holocaust was good, was able to produce such evidence, would we all have to change our position on the moral worth of the Holocaust? I would say no, but that means there is a possible world in which the good is not identical to general human well-being. And if A equals A, there is no possible world in which A does not equal A. If the good is identical to human well-being, then there is no possible world in which the good is not identical to human well-being. Finally, St. Rahman said that morality is subjective to a group of individuals, aka a society, not just one individual. Fine, what makes our society's view of morality more valid than Nazi Germany's? He will likely reply, because Hitler's views of morality are not conducive to the flourishing of society. But that begs the question, why should anyone care whether people flourish? Again, I'm not asking how people have come to care about human flourishing, I'm asking why should we even care in the first place? And if morality is contingent upon a society, let me pose this question. If World War II had been lost and Hitler had managed to brainwash everyone except the Jews, that killing Jews was right, then would that then make it right just because society has determined to be so? Again, Saint Rahman will likely respond, no because it's not conducive to human flourishing. Which again begs the question, what makes your view that human flourishing is good more value than another view that says Aryan flourishing is good? I'm not asking how you've come to determine right and wrong, because that's, that's an epistemological question. I'm asking the ontological one. What is the basis of you calling your own moral worldview more valid? In the absence of any sort of objective standard, you simply have no basis to make such a judgment. St. Rahman suggested that I made this argument because I want to bolster my own ego. That is, out of my supposed ego, I want there to be objective morality so I can vindicate my moral judgments as more righteous than another person's, and thus vindicate myself as a more righteous person. In light of the fact that my entire worldview suggests that God saved me by grace, and not because of anything he saw in me, this is an absurd ad hominem. Now, he did have a valid critique, namely that I used the term bait and switch incorrectly. I probably should have used the term equivocation instead. That is, to say, to me, that's wrong, but that's not actually wrong, uses the term wrong in two different ways. In the first clause, wrong is used to denote a subjective preference, and in the second clause, wrong is used to denote the lack of an objective standard. For the record, I've made this argument precisely because atheists and agnostics were saying this exact thing to me, so there are people who make this type of argument. 
So, to summarize, I am not arguing about what the terms good and evil mean, i.e. moral semantics, nor am I arguing about how we come to know right and wrong. It's ironic because addressing my argument as though it was dealing with these topics is to straw man my argument. I'm arguing that in the absence of an objective standard, all such definitions of morality become arbitrary and are completely unfounded. It leaves us with moral relativism and the problems that follow. Why? Let me explain this. Let's presuppose that there is no God for a moment. From an objective standpoint, morality would just exist in the minds of people. Right and wrong is the construct of the human mind. And therefore, from an objective standpoint, no moral worldview of any single individual is more right or more wrong than another. They're just different. Your moral worldview is no more right or wrong than Kim Jong-un's, it's just different. For the record, I am not arguing for the existence of objective morality at this point, or arguing for the existence of any god or gods yet. I am simply pointing out why moral relativism follows from atheism and the implications of moral relativism. So any comments trashing Christianity or biblical ethics or the existence of God are completely irrelevant to the point of the video. While not all comments did this, there certainly were some people who did. To anyone who makes such a comment in trying to refute what's been said, I have only this to say to you. Please go back and listen to the videos and stop strawmanning my argument. Thank you for watching.